a listener production. Hey, Ben Sion Siebert here with The Briefing. Women, people assigned female at birth and gender diverse people have to deal with issues men just don't. Menstruation, endometriosis, IVF treatment, breast screening, the list goes on. But most people get the same amount of sick leave, no matter their gender or sex. And there are growing calls for a new kind of leave to be rolled out across workplaces around Australia to acknowledge the burden of managing reproductive health. Now, this category includes some issues that affect men and people assigned male at birth, like recovering from vasectomy and prostate cancer checks. Hundreds of thousands of public servants across Queensland and Victoria will soon get access to reproductive health leave, and unions are campaigning for it to become a standard and a right for all workers in Australia. But research shows that many Australian women would also be worried about being discriminated against if they ask for leave for reproductive issues. So how would it work, and what effect might it have on gender relations in the workplace? And more or less, can we expect this to be the next frontier of workers' rights in Australia? Well, joining me in the studio for more is listener journalist Lauren Howarth. Lauren, thanks so much for joining us again on The Briefing. Why are more conversations happening in this space right now? Yeah, so there's been this recent movement from some states, like you mentioned, as well as unions. So unions are campaigning for the federal government to introduce 10 days of paid reproductive leave per year. So this would allow workers uh, to have time off to deal with a range of reproductive health issues, including things like IVF treatment, periods and breast screening. And it wouldn't just be for women. Men would also be able to take this reproductive leave for things like fertility treatment, prostate screening, as well as time off to recover from a vasectomy. And just going back to what the states have been doing, so the Queensland government has recently agreed to 10 days of reproductive leave for all its public sector workers, and that will be in place by September 30, while public and community sector workers in Victoria could also soon have access to this leave. Um, The state's treasurer has signed a collective agreement, so employees could see five days added to their sick leave entitlement. That agreement is going to a ballot sometime this month, and that will then be subject to fair work approval shortly after. I caught up with Professor Jay Shree Kulkarni. She's the director of Her Centre Australia and she told me that we've reached a new level of female empowerment and that's also helping to lead this conversation. The whole social movements that have been taking place uh, over time have suddenly enabled, well not perhaps suddenly, but in the last five years or so have enabled women to speak up about the things that really are troubling them and, you know, the sorts of things that are have been quiet in the past generations of shush, don't talk about that, that's women's business, a secret business, suddenly is not secret. We also spoke about how brain biology research has made leaps and bounds in the past 10 years. And that's been really critical in understanding issues like menopause, depression or premenstrual depression and how a person is struggling with their mental health during these reproductive hormone fluctuations. So do we have any data or statistics on how these issues affect women and people assigned female at birth in the workplace, uh, I guess, in reduced productivity due to these reproductive issues? Yeah, so the latest policy brief by the Australian Women's Health Network shows that women might even give up working full time due to trying to manage things like endometriosis. Analysis also suggests that menopause can be causing women under the age of 55 to leave the workforce early. And the Australian Institute of Superannuation and Tax estimates that 10% of working women actually retire early due to menopause. And Professor Jay Shri Kulkarni says it can also affect an employee's mental clarity and overall workplace contribution when they're dealing with these issues. Now, of course, not everybody experiences this and not everybody experiences the severity of symptoms, but for some women, there is a significant issue that she's trying to struggle with. And so a small break in the work might enable her to reboot, to reset sometimes in terms of sleep disturbance, uh, which then, of course, robs her of her capacity to have good cognitive function the next day as well, or or just to be able to, you know, take it easy for a week and then come back again into the workforce might be very helpful. 
Okay, so a few companies in Australia have actually already introduced paid leave for reproductive health, and that includes Future Super. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, so Future Super introduced the policy just over four years ago, and they did this because they did this employment engagement survey, and they found that men were way happier than women, uh, scores at 86% compared to just 38%. So they asked women what they wanted, and paid period and menopausal leave came up. So now anyone at Future Super who experienced periods or menopause, they can take up to six days of paid leave off a year, and that's separate to their sick leave. And you don't even need a medical certificate because the company doesn't want to see periods or menopause treated the same way as we do an illness or, or an injury. And I had a chat with Kai Prasser. So she's a communication specialist at Future Super, but she was the people and culture advisor at the time the leave was implemented. And, and she told me that the team can use the leave however they want. Like it's, it's pretty flexible. We've seen people use it for a few hours while they wait for medication to kick in or if they just need to take it slow to team members taking the full day off. We are also a remote workplace, uh, which means that people can choose to work at home or from one of our co-working spaces. But our policy does um, specifically state that, you know, if people are working from the office, they can choose to work from home. So how has it all been going? What's the response been since this kind of leave was introduced? Yeah, Kai told me that it's been going really well, actually. And so far this year, their stats show that about 10% of employees have access to leave, each person roughly taken a day. And she told me that all employees have embraced and they've accepted the policy as well. The walls didn't cave in, the leave take-up didn't send us to bankruptcy, and the men are okay. Our team is consistently proud to work at Future Group, and it has created a safe space to talk about health openly and more broadly. And talking about periods and menopause at work has definitely been normalised. All that said, given that we're talking about issues that disproportionately affect women and gender diverse people, is there a risk that people might feel discriminated against? Um, Will people actually be comfortable taking reproductive leave? Yeah, I think it's an interesting point that we need to look at. And there was this National Women's Health Survey report that was put out just last year, and they surveyed thousands of women to actually get their thoughts on menstrual and menopause leave. Overall, most supported the additional paid leave, around 60% did. However, most thought that it was embarrassing to tell their boss that they had their period or that they were experiencing menopause symptoms. And more than three quarters believe that their employers would actually use the leave as an excuse to discriminate against women. And they also believe that their co-workers wouldn't be understanding if someone took period or menopause leave. So it's pretty concerning then to think, you know, it'd be great to have this leave, but not good if Mm. people aren't actually using it. And this report listed a few recommendations. So we'll just go through a couple of those. Um, They wanted the paid leave to take into account the full range of health issues that affect a woman's ability to work. So not just those related to periods or menopause. They want more public awareness. So it's not like taboo, like you're not like, oh, I don't want to go up and tell my boss that I've got my period. And they want to make sure that any policies that are introduced uh, don't increase discrimination against women in the workplace and that they can take that leave without any fear of consequence. Has this kind of leave been trialled elsewhere overseas? Any other countries have tried it? Yeah, so a few countries have actually passed laws allowing women to take days off for reproductive health issues. Uh, Spain, there you need a doctor's certificate, but you can have three to five days off per month. Uh, In Japan, companies are actually legally required to allow women to have menstrual leave, but there is no requirement that the leave is to be paid. But it is barely used in Japan, though. So there was this study in two years ago that found less than 10% of women took the leave. And similar issues have been reported in Indonesia where employees are entitled to two days of paid menstrual leave a month. But yeah, it goes back to that thing where that leave is there for people to use, but it's just not being used because people find it uncomfortable to talk to their bosses about it. So if this was introduced as a national law in something like the Fair Work Act, what do experts think that it would look like in Australia? Yeah, I asked Professor Jay Shri Kulkarni about this and she told me that she hopes that changes can take place, but it's really important that all the details are worked through for each issue. And you also need to look at what uh, workplaces can afford and what works best for both businesses and the employees. Uh, She talked to me about how menopause transition, for example, that's about a 10-year process. So what will that leave sort of look like over that amount of time? 
And it could even include things like offering more time working from home, so having those flexible work options, or even unpaid leave if that does work for both the business and employees. So she told me that it's really important that we kind of keep all options on the table and not to just go with down one path and rule out one thing. And it's also another way then of empowering women by giving us a choice of what we want. I think it is important to have a palette of things that can work for both the the business as well as the employee. But even a, a consideration about all this will raise the topic so that it's no longer hush-hush or shameful or whatever has been the stigma that, uh, you know, women have had to cope with in the past, that you just don't talk about this thing. It raises the issues of women's health, mental health, to a uh, discussion around the water cooler or in the tea rooms, and uh, that is a very good thing. So with all this taken into account, what do you think in your experience in, in the workplace, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty lucky. I don't have like super painful periods, but I know that a couple of my colleagues, they do. And one of my colleagues has endometriosis and she does have to take off quite a bit of time for work because it is quite painful for her. And I think just having that option there for that extra paid leave would be a really good thing. At least it's there as an option for people to take it if they do need it and not having to rely on their sick leave or their annual leave even to take off the time if they're in pain. Okay, well, Lauren, thanks so much for joining us again on The Briefing and it'll be fascinating to see how this develops. Sounds good. Thanks, Bensian. Lauren Howarth there. And that's it for The Briefing today. But before you go, if you found this episode interesting, please share it with a friend. And did you know we put out all our weekend briefing interviews and some select weekday briefing episodes on YouTube? Just search Listener Newsroom, that's L-I-S-T-N-R Newsroom, and hit that subscribe button. You can also check us out on Instagram at The Briefing Podcast. I'm Ben Sion Siebert. Catch you next time.